and I think we should uh, get started. We have about... Uh, I'm sorry? Yes. Yes, I don't know. So, all of you who are not speaking, please mute your microphones. Okay, that's a lot more quiet. Okay. <laughs> um, so, some lovely questions uh, today. Five of them. So, we'll see how we do on, uh, on time. Um, so, the first question uh, has a little bit to do with what I felt was my inspiration to work on today. So the question is, does everybody have guardians or helpers in higher worlds, angels, or are there totally lonely people in this regard too? What are the relationships between humans and their guardians in general? Why do higher beings take on guardianship over a certain person? So that's a rather uh, big topic and I can't yeah, just to go about this one question could take a few hours. Um, so I'll just go skipping about it uh, rather rapidly. Um, so uh, usually um, a guardian is not present when we are not incarnated. Um, so we do have friends and guides in, in higher worlds, but uh, we are usually able to um, to function quite well in these higher worlds without guidance because we can very easily um, see the essence of things and there's not so much confusion, there's not so much feeling lost and um, wondering about, wondering what existence is for because um, movement is very easy in these higher worlds if we think of something like I want to know something or I want to guide or I want to see something then very easily we are transported to the essence of what we seek as long as we are able to imagine it, to have a part of it inside of us then we can find a greater source outside of us so in these higher worlds generally guardianship or guides are not that necessary but down here in the incarnated world they are um, so, what you see is that um, depending on the, the personality which has developed um, in the incarnated body and the uh, karma of the spirit, so very much by the nature of the vessel and the journey of the vessel, it will attract uh, guides for a longer or a shorter time. So actually most of the guides we have, they are there for a, a short time. So they are there to help us with one specific lesson or one specific step in our evolution which we want to, to make. And sometimes these events can be uh, very short. They are just here to help us to fall in love with the right person. So they are there maybe for two or three weeks to make sure that our relationship gets started and then they move on. Uh, or they can be there to ensure that we learn something. So they can be very specific to uh, a school or a place of learning or even uh, a spiritual group so that you acquire a guide when you join a spiritual school and they are with you while you're studying in the school and they leave you again when you leave the school or stop that path of, uh, of, of learning. So these are uh, what you would call specific guides. So they have one specific thing they teach and yeah, whatever teach uh, a student arrives, they will teach them. Um, but in general, mo most people are more interested into the person-bound guides. So they're not as common, um, because in a way, um, um, the, 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 the guides who teach one thing, they're specialists, and, the and the guides who guide a person through all stages of life are more generalists. Um, these generalists also come in, in various types. Um, there are generalists who in a way um, have followed or want to follow a very similar path to you. So in general 
a guide is a little bit more advanced than you, has for instance had a very similar life to the one you are trying to lead. So they have a little bit of experience of what you'll be going through and they will um, guide you or share their experience or their guidance with you. But sometimes it's also possible to attract a guide who is interested more in um, leading a life like you are doing. So they're more tagging along with you for the ride and of course they try to get involved and to learn and to experiment and they're in a way growing and learning together with you. And often the process of being guided is a little bit of both. But in general the guide is a little bit more advanced than you are. <coughs> Um, there is also a very big distinction between guides who have had experience in being incarnated and guides who have not. In general, a guide has never had a physical incarnation. So a lot of their uh, guidance or how they look at problems is from a very spiritual perspective. And their advice tends to be more uh, valuable on a spiritual level than on a practical level. So, for instance, if you ask of these guides, where have I left my keys? He's like, what? Keys? Um, okay, metal uh, object. Um, okay, can you com explain the concept of material to me? So, he's not really good at, at helping you with very physical things. So, um, this is also not their mission. I could not quite catch your question. Does it apply to both? Um, yeah, no, this is specifically for the not previously incarnated guides, which is generally the majority. Um, and they, they are very, in a way, they have their own specialization, which is the spiritual development, rather than helping with um, dealing with the physical world. So these um, types of guides who have not been incarnated before, their specific way of guiding is that they can see your karma, what you planned before, and they can help you remember. Um, because in a way, uh, you lost sight of what is your mission, what is your purpose, and why are you yeah, having all these lessons. And yeah, they can see, so they can in a way remind you or show you like this is important and this is a problem you should work on or this is unimportant, this is something you should ignore. And they can give you dreams or other signals to more or less help you to remember, to, to jog your memory of what you knew before you incarnated. Um, if you have guides who have had experience in being incarnated before um, they're a lot better at helping you with the specific problems of, of being incarnated. Um, so one of the big ones is, is dealing with thoughts and emotions and also dealing with, with health issues. Um, so as, as I want to, to make clear, not everybody has this type of guides and these other types of guides will try to help you also with emotions, thoughts and uh, physical uh, imbalances, but they're just not as experienced. <clears throat> One of the um, uh, big challenges for us while we are in a body is to remain our balance. Um, because only if we are functioning well, our life force is flowing well, then we can utilize this life force, this power, to transform ourselves. But if the life force is totally bound up by thoughts, uh, traumas, things from the past, worries about the future, emotions you're having, then the life force is not available for your spirit to work with. So you're experiencing a lot of things. You have very deep and strong emotions and thoughts and dreams and ideas, but there is no spiritual evolution. And this is a state which unfortunately a lot of people find themselves in, that their thoughts and their <clears throat> emotions are very strong but also very crystallized into patterns and there is very little free energy for the spirit to work with. So, and what you often see then is that the, the patterns repeat themselves without transformation. So for instance a person might always 
yeah, end up in abusive relationships or always lose their money or always be very lucky when gambling or uh, there's a certain pattern to it which can be pleasant or unpleasant but the pattern always stays the same because the energy is bound up into maintaining this pattern, into stabilizing this pattern. So for spiritual growth it is very important to be able to in a way voluntarily destabilize yourself without losing control and without losing your harmony because if you're disharmonious you also cannot make a step forward. And um, especially the guides who have had this incarnation before, who've had this unique experience before and it doesn't have to have been a human incarnation, it can have been an animal incarnation or a plant incarnation. They know how to work with this, how to rebalance all these energies, how to get out of thought patterns and other cycles which you get trapped in, in physical, in the physical form. Um, so change, uh, change of environment, change of people you're with, uh, traveling, change of job, these are all very um, very good for uh, yeah, renewing your your life force with stimulating it and preventing it from crystallizing too much uh, but also too much chaos is also not good because then you're all the time using your life force just to adapt to all the changes to all the stress instead of um, yeah having it available to work with so you need kind of a stability uh, the, 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 the middle ground between being totally crystallized and being totally flexible in chaos. And this is also a very individual thing. Some people function better if they have a relatively large amount of order. Other people function better and their spirits grow better if they have a relatively large amount of chaos. So you can't just in general say like, okay, um, life has to be organized and there need to be rituals for you to have spiritual development. Because there are both schools of thought and especially in the East you often find in India, China, Japan that they really favor order and discipline and you find that in many um, yeah, African and Native American uh, cultures that they favor more the, the chaos approach of totally disregarding uh, the feelings of the body, the weather, the, the rhythm, the time of day and that you should yeah in a way always challenge yourself to remain creative and to remain in a creative uh, flow. But ultimately you need the balance. It's just that it's different for people who are born in these different cultures. Um, so the next yeah, question is uh, are there totally lonely people? Well, uh, no. And this brings me to actually one of the topics I felt inspired to talk about today which is a strength and um, also surrender. So what you find a lot within the, the, the Christian mysticism is there is a lot of focus on uh, surrendering. Um, surrendering to, uh, to the Holy Spirit, surrendering to Jesus Christ, the Savior, um, or surrendering to the mercy of uh, 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 the Virgin Mary. Um, but what is very important is to, to realize that surrendering is very different from uh, being powerless or not taking responsibility. So for instance, if I have um, a, an area which I'm weak in, so I'm not able to take care of myself. So and if I then go into a hospital and I let the doctor or the nurse take care of me, I can say like, see, I'm do doing very good, I'm completely surrendering, I allow them to take care of me, to control what I eat, to control what exercises I do, I'm in complete surrender. Um, but this is actually not what is meant by surrender. Uh, this is more that you are running away from your own responsibilities, from that part of your life, from the intricacies and the difficulties of that part of your life and you're trying to shove your responsibility onto somebody else. You're trying to make the doctor or the nurse carry your burden, carry your load. And that is not what is meant by surrender. Um, surrender is actually that you are quite capable of working with this energy, 
but um, you feel that your own guidance, your own inspiration is of a lesser order than that of a higher. So if we take the same example, I'm very well able in this example uh, to, for instance, uh, uh, um, generate money. And um, if I would surrender in the wrong way, I would say like, okay, well, um, let somebody else generate money because I know how to do it, but I'm not the one to do it. I should be in surrender. So you tell me what to do, what job to do, how to work. Um, this is the wrong kind of surrender. The right kind of surrender is to say like, okay, I have this ability to, uh, to gather money, but what to purpose should it serve? Because money itself, power itself, energy itself uh, is only a tool. And that you say like, okay, my inspiration of what to do with this money might be limited to buying a nice car, buying a nice house, buying nice food. But yeah, this is not really transforming me or transforming the world. Um, so I ask somebody with a higher inspiration to guide me on this. And I might go to a guru or a teacher and ask him what should I do with this money or where should this money go or how should it be applied. And this person might tell me to, I don't know, go to, to Africa or to India and to start a communal farm there or to do something with the money which will help me grow and which will also transform the world. So it becomes better and it leads to more spiritual development. And this is surrender. So first you need to have something to be able to surrender it to the higher authority. And if you don't have something, then there is no surrender. But the opposite problem is that if you are not taking control over something, you're in a way inviting other powers to take control over it. Um, because um, in a way nature abhors a vacuum. There is always something there. Um, and either it is your energy or it is somebody else's energy. It is a little bit like they said about nations. Uh, every country has an army, either it is its own army or it is the neighbor, neighboring country's army. Um, and it is the same. Uh, so there is something valuable, just like a country, it has people, it has resources. And there is always a power which is interested in using those resources. And either your spirit is interested and is using the resources or other spirits are using the same resources, which could be yours if you defended them well enough. So in the areas where uh, you are weak, um, other powers will, uh, uh, will come. And these powers can be benevolent or less benevolent. So in the most negative sense, um, it will uh, uh, attract a spirit which will try to increase um, the power of your, uh, in a way, separated part to become the dominant part and thereby take over the rest of your incarnation. So for instance, if in my life I have a problem with, um, with violence and aggression, and it's like, no, I don't want to work with these heavy aggressive energies and I'm totally going to, to run away from them. And then another spirit will come and it will say like, okay, there is all this aggressive energy there and it is not being controlled, so I can control it because there is no resistance. And by increasing this energy, this spirit will get more and more control of my incarnation. So this anger will start to dominate my thoughts, my emotions, my actions. And thereby my own spirit will be more and more pushed away in favor of the invader who will take more and more control over my life. So this is a very... Uh, kind of, it's a worst case scenario, what can happen. Um, slightly better scenario is that you attract a parasite. Uh, these parasites are also called larvae. Uh, this is more of an animalistic form. It has no real desire to take over, but it feeds on the type of energy which you yeah, are not protecting, which you made available. So. This larva will come, it will also inhabit the part of me which has the anger and it will feed on the anger and it will stimulate the anger and 
on the short term, when it is absorbing the anger, I will feel better. I will feel, gosh, this power from outside is helping me. I don't feel so angry anymore. I don't feel so upset anymore. I feel so peaceful. So people often mistake it as it is helping. But in a way it is draining their energy, their anger, which should be their own, but they don't want it. So they feed the, uh, the larva. But at a certain time the larva will have eaten up all the anger which is there and then it will want more because it is hungry. And then it will start stimulating your anger. It will make you angry and then very quickly after making you angry it will absorb uh, the energy which you generate. And again and again it will push you to, yeah, to generate this angry energy and then absorb it again. And uh, this also pushes people into, uh, into a cycle where they lose a lot of their life force because yeah, it just gets eaten up in this useless process. Well, to them useless process. But both these types of occurrence, so getting in an infestation either of a very primitive sort or a more advanced sort, um, also helps us to confront our weaknesses. It, uh, they're in a way our teachers. They show us like this part of yourself is not under your control, it is not obeying your spirit, it is not in harmony with the rest of you. And instead of ignoring it like you normally would, they force you to work with it. Because otherwise this part of your life will disturb your inclination more and more. Um, so these are kind of the negative types of teaching or guidance which you attract. On the positive side, um, if you have an energy you don't control, you can also attract um, a guiding spirit. And this guiding spirit um, has had the same experience of like learning, in, often in their incarnation, how to work with that energy, how to deal with this energy. And it can, usually a guiding spirit is then either used to be incarnated, or it is a servant of the god or goddess, who is actually responsible for teaching people to work with his energy. And um, so if you have, find that you're having a problem with, for instance, anger, if you don't do something with it, maybe from your positive karma you also attract a positive guide. But it's also very good to pray that you may receive a guide to help you to deal with your anger or whatever. The, the, the sin or the problem is which you are having a problem really connecting with and dealing with. Um, such a guiding spirit will uh, often try to uh, demonstrate to you the positive way of working with this energy. So often you will feel that you're in a way kind of pushed back in your consciousness, you go in the, in the back seat while the spirit is driving and controlling this energy. So it is in a way giving you an example of a positive way to use your anger. Uh, that will show you, like, see, I can in a way just make myself be heard and make myself be respected and thereby prevent an escalation of the conflict because I'm more clear on what I want instead of being angry and frustrated and sad about it. And um, uh, ultimately the guiding spirit is not there to accept responsibility. So it will only stay with you for a limited amount of time because it is in a way true kind of a divine mercy that you receive this guidance. But also divine mercy is in this way finite if you don't deserve it, if you don't use it. Because there is a limited amount of guides, limited amount of energy available and they will just go elsewhere where they are more appreciated or more effective. Um, so we always have guides, we are never completely lonely and if we create positive karma and we ask for it, the quality of our guides will just be a lot better. Um, the guides who, uh, who are in the service of these uh, deities, they have a very strong um, urge to fulfill their mission because this is the way they grow, by helping others grow. It is their job to be a teacher. Um, I heard some noise. Is there a question? Because I did not hear it. Okay, I guess there's not a question. 
Um, so, what are the relationships between humans and their guardians like in general? Um, well, in general, they are uh, symbiotic relationships. It is uh, most common that both the human and the spirit both benefit from the experience. Um, often spirits who want to take incarnation themselves will spend several lifetimes, up to 10 or 20, in guiding beings which are incarnated, just to learn a little bit second-hand from what are the things to, to work with and what are the difficulties you run into. and. Um, so they are a little bit better prepared. Uh, it's also important to note that humans are not the only ones who have guides. Animals have guides, uh, plants have guides too. Everything which incarnates can have guides, even stones can have guides who take care of them. Um, what you often find is that if the organisms are more simple, that one guide is actually responsible for many of them. While human beings tend to be so complex, that uh, actually one human needs several guides to take care of them. Um, so often if you look at, at nature, you find that there can be one guide taking care of like five animals or maybe 20 trees or 100 trees or thousands of stones. Um, but in general, if you look at a human, you find that they have usually about seven guides necessary just to deal with one human being. So we are uh, using up a lot of guidance. <laughs> um, the relationship is, is, is generally um, uh, symbiotic because we, uh, we both learn from each other, we inspire each other, we pool our energies. And the way the guidance helps is often um, also they try to attract the right energies to us and to guide us in this way. So they're in a way creating wishes and by their power of, of wishing, their magical uh, powers, certain people and events and other things are drawn to us and uh, they're in a way helping us to manifest our karma. Um, but um, the type of guides we attract are generally very similar uh, to our, our personality pattern. So they're often, um, like if we are very humorous, our guides tend to be humorous. If we are very serious, our guides tend to be serious. If we are very spiritual, our guides tend to be spiritual. If we are very material, our guides tend to be material in nature. So in a way they reinforce our tendencies. And this is also the problem or the weak point of guides. Um, because the guides, they, have, they are attracted to your life because it goes into a certain direction. But your life path can narrow and become too narrow, too fixed, too crystallized, even though you have guides with you to, to help to guide you. Because you're in a way of the same group and within the same group, yeah, things tend to um, yeah, go towards harmony, to go towards agreeing with each other. And then you feel very peaceful, but your life becomes very stable, very boring. And it's a little bit harder if you have a more complex personality and therefore also different types of guides who pull you in different directions. So often these people find that even when they're praying for guidance or making contact with their guides or having dreams, that there's a lot of variation because they're often offered like three different solutions for, for every problem. Like, oh, do you want to teach with it in a humorous, work with it in a humorous manner? Or do you want to use a very aggressive manner? Or do you want to be very organized about it and very systematical about it? And in this way, um, all these fragments, all these powers in you are used and they're taught to work together. And this is actually a better type of guidance. But it also depends very much on the personality you incarnate if you can attract also this more complex type of guidance. Um, this more complex type of guidance is also often uh, a sign of people who want to um, increase their skill as a spirit or who are al already quite skilled as a spirit to work with this more complex personality structures. Um, and it is often a, a case of a little bit that if 
the spirit is a little bit ahead of other spirits, then they're uh, often early in life, they find that there is so much complexity, so much different choices and directions going on, that they actually have more trouble in life than people who are more simple in nature. And that only later in life, usually after their 30s, then they start to catch up a little bit with the rest of the world. Because they spend a lot of time in their youth just trying to work out how to deal with the complexity which is them instead of learning how to deal with the world around them. Um, and yeah, it can take to the mid-30s to late-30s for people to kind of reach a balance with the other more simple people. <clears throat> um, yes, why do beings take on guardianship of a certain person? Um, a guardianship can be uh, is usually extended on a uh, on a need basis. So, if uh, for instance, in, if I look at my own life, uh, occasionally I've had a guardian, but I've only been granted a guardian in periods when yeah it was obvious that I could not yeah manage myself. Um, so it's often a manner of like lacking experience, um, uh, lacking strength, uh, having a yeah, high vulnerability um, and also being very attractive for powers to interfere with or attract or by in a way sacrificing yourself, putting yourself in a position which is very um, dangerous or challenged. Uh, so in general, unfortunately, I don't have protectors or guides. I have some things watching me and alerting me, but they feel I should be able to take care of myself in general. And it's also a process of learning. So for me, I've had some lives in where there was yeah, uh, physical and energetic conflict. And <clears throat> they say like, okay, well, you've chosen to, to work with that, to learn from that, and you can continue your learning in this life. And some people, they don't have this as a purpose, as a goal, and any conflict or disturbance would just be a distraction from the path their spirit is taking. And they are kind of like protected from distractions so they can grow more quickly. And these grants of protection, they're often... Um, in a way due to compensation. So, for instance, if a person makes um, a sacrifice or does rituals or does other things to make the energy which they would otherwise spend on protection available to another power, this power will protect them. So it's in a way, um, instead of like learning how to fight for yourself, uh, you pay taxes, so there is an army and there's a police to protect you. So always in a way you are paying for it. It is just that you're doing it in a different way. Do you pay to have a professional army and police? Or do you go and study judo, karate, sword fighting or some other sports so you can manage yourself? Um, guardianship can uh, occasionally also be extended by um, uh, divine mercy. Um, in general, we are supposed to only receive challenges which are of our level. Uh, so you're not supposed to be given a problem which you cannot solve or an enemy you cannot defend yourself against. And that doesn't matter that you will always win, but it does mean that there should always be a possibility for you to learn something. And if the enemy is totally incomprehensible or has techniques which you don't understand or you cannot see, then you're not learning anything except being losing and being trampled and being uh, sub yeah, subjected to some, some power. And if there's a real disbalance in power, then you can always appeal to the divine laws, to the powers which regulate the inclinations in the cosmos. So very locally that is uh, uh, the nature spirits, uh, uh, the, the consciousness of the planet Earth, the consciousness of our solar system, um, the gods of karma. And these powers will usually then send a protector or either teach you 
uh, the skills or give you the power to make the battle a little bit more fair so that at least you can learn something from your struggles. So this is also a reason why sometimes guardians are granted or sent to you to yeah, even, even out the battle if it becomes too yeah, lopsided. Okay, I can see I spent more than half an hour on the first of five questions. Um, so I don't think I will actually manage to, to answer all of the questions today. Uh, but we'll see how far we can uh, we can get. Um, but this is a very yeah, deep and interesting topic. So before I continue to the next question, I would like to see if there are any more questions about this. Okay, the question is, can you elaborate on the private police protection part? Um, yes. Um, in a way, it is always possible to, to get protection. Um, and it can be, as I said, either through uh, divine law, that it is decided that you uh, are entitled to protection, but you just need to ask for it because also the powers tend not to intrude in your life. You have the guidance, so you call the police and ask them to investigate and hunt the criminal, or you don't call the police and decide to deal with it yourself. And this is something which is very important to remember, because many people complain like, oh, why do bad things happen to me? Why is the wicked one not punished? Well, because you don't ask for it. And that is a very essential thing. Uh, to, to really realize that you are the one uh, who has sovereignty over your own existence. And even though, like in the physical world, you don't have the sovereignty, police will investigate you and, will, like the NSA, will tap your phones, read your emails and do other things. But in the spiritual world, it is not like this. They respect your right, your sovereignty, to lead your own life the way you want it to. And the yeah, powers of light will only come in if you invite them and you grant them permission to interfere with you. Um, the uh, important thing is also that uh, what happens many times is when they are not answered by the light side, people uh, tend to continue asking until somebody answers them. And that is usually then the not so light side. So we have lessons we are supposed to learn, so we get challenges. And um, the light side wants us to accept our challenge. So they will solve some problems for us, they will give us the support or what we need to solve the problem, but they won't do everything for us because it is our journey. It is, And if they would solve the problem, I would not have learned anything and it would have been totally useless to have been in a situation to have had the problem in the first place. And they don't want our lives to be useless, so they allow us to learn for ourselves. Uh, the opposite is true usually of the dark side. Um, if you look at the dark side of the cosmos, these are beings who are very much interested in gaining power, gaining influence, gaining control, and they want to use other people uh, for their manifestation. So a spirit from the dark side will say like, gosh, I don't have a body of my own, but if I can use somebody else's body, I don't need a body of my own. Why would I go through this whole process of incarnating or forgetting everything if I can just use somebody else's body? And, um, or why would I yeah, become alive and get all, all this life force, which I could need to use to transform myself if the other person can just grant this life force to me, and I could uh, uh, use this to grow in this way by using their life force instead of having to get the body. To, um, yes, thank you. Okay. And um, 
uh, there are also neutral powers where you can more or less strike a deal with them. So, as I said, like it always requires uh, um, a certain amount of energy and you can focus on a certain part of your life by allowing other powers to take care of another part of your life. And this can be a mutually beneficial trade. So, uh, if there are things you don't need or which are very easy for you to provide, um, for instance, life force is a very valuable commodity in, um, in the spirit world. But here it is very easy to obtain. So I could go to the supermarket and buy some bananas and it will cost me one euro and I will have an amount of life force which is trapped in fruit which is to spiritual beings very valuable. And for me it is relatively easy to, to get them to obtain. And instead of eating the bananas myself I could say, like, gosh, I will sacrifice these bananas, I will make a little sacrificial meal and offer this to another power or to another spirit. And they can use this life force to help me, to protect me, to uh, um, uh, protect my house, protect my bedroom, uh, protect my astral body while I'm sleeping. Um, and you can ask them to do several things for you. And this can just be like any contract, like any business arrangement. Uh, and there are powers who you yeah, can contact to make these arrangements with. Also the light powers, while they will never uh, demand a payment, because they see it as their purpose and their duty uh, to protect you or to help you, uh, they're often very happy if you make these things available for them. Because instead of them having to look around and to gather all this energy and then to sacrifice what little energy they have in protecting you, you make their job a lot easier. Um, so you can compare it a little bit to um, there is a police and the police have a duty to protect you, but if you don't report any crime, you don't tell them what happened. Uh, so yeah, they find it very hard to catch the burglar or uh, the person who stole from you if you don't tell them what they look like or what was taken. And in the same way, by being more forthcoming, by sharing, by opening up more, by uh, yeah, your private police force can uh, can work a lot more efficiently. Um, another method you can use if you feel that your life is getting too complex, but this is a rather advanced and dangerous method, is to split off a part of yourself. Um, so you can, in a way, create an energetic double of yourself, an energetic copy. It does not have your life force, because it does not have a physical body. So it's in a way, it's a weaker copy. But it still can have a lot of knowledge, a lot of skill. And you can task it to do something for you. So, for instance, you can task it to protect yourself, or even to protect somebody else, a loved one. And it will do what it can, and if you make life force available to it, it will also use this life force to protect you. And you can also do the same with your own, uh, with your own guides, of course. Um, the risk of splitting off part of yourself is that if you have a bad relationship with certain parts of yourself, you're in a way repressing heavier energies or negative or dark sides in yourself, that you will push them into this double and this double will turn into uh, your shadow, your personal demon. Everything you dislike about yourself will manifest as it and if you are having a fight with yourself you will also have a fight with this double and if actually more inside you is dark than light then the double will be stronger than you and it can kill you, destroy you or make you sick. So these are very advanced methods which you can use uh, really to confront your own shadow by manifesting it in, your, in a copy of your own being. But um, these are techniques which you should only do actually um, in, in they're, they're part of the, the, the Buddhist way of, of self-development. So if you, you have a Lama or another Buddhist teacher can guide you through this process and learn and teach you how to become friends and to how to harmonize yourself again with your shadow, then it can be safe to do. But other than that, it is not very safe to do. And it's the same if you don't create so much a copy of yourself, but you create a construct, because this is also possible to create a golem. 
you gather energies from other places, from other objects, and you combine them into an energy body which you give a certain task. Um, other spirits can take over the, this energy body, and also this energy body can, uh, because it is linked to you, can also absorb it, become inspired by your own negativity and can turn into Frankenstein's monster. Um, oh, yes, what happens if your double kills you? Well, it usually takes over your body. Uh, because you're actually the same spirit, it is just that your spirit has been split in two. And uh, then the question is, which part will be the dominant part, which will be the, uh, the part which is in control. Because normally if you are one spirit, then already there is this internal struggle for control. You have your internal demon and angel telling you to be nice or to be angry. Or, and... Um, while it is internal, you can use your own life force to, to harmonize it and to transform yourself. But if you split off part of yourself, if your spirit is cut in two, then one part will have the life force and the other part won't. And usually because one part has the life force, that will be the dominant part because it has a lot more power available to it. But if it yeah, loses, then yeah, it is... Um, yeah, just replaced by the other part, which will usually continue the battle and that other part will be cast out of the body, so you will just change positions around and the other part will inhabit your body, you, in a way the evil you will inhabit the body and the good you will be outside instead of the other way around. So it's very much like the, the story of uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, so, those of you who don't know the story, it is exactly like that. There is a, a essentially good man who tries to repress all evil and to make it go away. And, uh, but this evil becomes concentrated in an alternate persona, Mr. Hyde, who occasionally takes over, but Mr. Hyde is more powerful than Dr. Jekyll. And slowly but surely, uh, the, yeah, uh, he takes over more and more of the, of the incarnation. So this is a very spiritual story, actually, and it's a very um, an extremely insightful exercise to to split yourself. But it's also a very dangerous exercise. So don't do it unless, like a teacher says, you are ready to do it, and you yourself feel that you're ready to do it. Um, the reabsorption of these separate selves, or at least maintaining contact and harmonizing with these separate selves should also be done regularly. So if you split off too much parts of yourself, then all these parts will yeah, become too different from yourself and will have a problem with reintegrating. In a way you will have given birth to a lot of other spirits who are also yeah, growing and manifesting and having their own lives. But uh, just like we find it very hard to become one with the Absolute again, uh, those other split off parts of yourself will find it very hard to become one with you again because of all the different experiences and uh, yeah it's 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 possible to fragment yourself and then also your life force your attention will also fragment itself and you will be spread too thin to really grow and develop very well so you can go insane by that and you can develop multiple personality disorder by such processes and you can also be born in a body with multiple personality disorder because you did this process in the past. Because it's not very common anymore to, to try to grow yourself in this way, but it used to be. <coughs> Especially in ancient Egypt, this was a structure which was yeah, utilized. <coughs> um, what happens with the double if the person dies physically? Well, basically nothing. Um, your own spirit will leave its body and the uh, spirit of the, of the double will also exist. And if there is enough harmony, you will in a way fuse again and then go into a separate incarnation. Um, you can also reintegrate actually while one part is incarnated and the other part is not. So if you don't fuse after death, then one part of you can incarnate and during this incarnation you can 
slowly allow this other part to to come into your body and to reabsorb it and to yeah reconnect with it so you become a whole person again uh, another possibility is that both you and your double will uh, will incarnate in separate bodies then you will have a very interesting relationship because you will feel that you are very connected very drawn together you can't be without each other but there will also be this anger and this resentment uh, and this polarity between the two of you and yeah they, they can be extremely hard and difficult relationships to experience but very necessary for healing the wound so you can reintegrate after one or both of you leave their bodies again. I actually had that experience myself of uh, splitting myself in, in two bodies and then actually one body killed the other body of my <laughs> being. Um, so the reintegration did not work very well in that life but in, a, in the next life I did manage to reintegrate. <clears throat> So, are there more questions on uh, on this subject? <clears throat> Persons high in hierarchy of an egregore can also get protection, watchdogs. Does this person have to pay some price for this, or is this granted to them for free? For instance, can there be reptilian kind of watchdogs? Do they belong to the Arimanic cosmos? Um, well, <clears throat> it is a little bit... Um, yes, you pay for it, but not directly. They are kind of like the, the secondary benefits of your, of your employment within that agricore. It is like if you're a um, uh, minister of state, you get a chauffeur or you get a security guard. <clears throat> and it's the same way if you're relatively high in an egregore. They know that if you um, yeah, become corrupted or become damaged, it can create a lot of damage and disruption to the rest of the egregore. So in a way it is also in the interest of the egregore to protect itself by protecting you. Just like it is in the interest of a country uh, not to allow other countries or other powers to influence their politicians. Um, because otherwise you just get a puppet government and these egregores like to be sovereign, they like to rule themselves, just like many countries do. Um, <clears throat> so there is not a direct price, but yeah, because your job is more demanding, uh, it requires more of you, so you pay for it in, in that way. <clears throat> And, well, yeah, about reptilians. Um, I noticed there is a lot of talk on the internet and that many people um, dislike reptilians or uh, insectoid life forms. And for some reason they feel that our own mammalian form is nicer or better. <coughs> Just a moment. So... In general, just because something is very different or very alien to us, doesn't make it any better or any worse. And it's important to deal with some of the preconceptions. Because in yeah, our uh, Western society, we have this association uh, between dragons, uh, snakes, uh, uh, and the beast, and evil, and the devil, and um, we also tend to regard uh, uh, these life forms, um, the fishes and reptilians, as being um, unemotional because in our world, in our manifested physical reality, um, they are unemotional. They lack certain parts of the brain, so they don't have our complexity. But this does not hold true for alien life forms. So alien life forms may seem very reptilian or insectoid or something like that to us. But that doesn't mean that they don't that they have a hive mind or they are emotionless. And there are actually uh, quite a few cases of more life forms which outwardly seem a lot more like us, which do have hive minds or which are emotionless. So, in regard to aliens, you can't really say that the form tells anything about 
the structure. Um, but we do have a lot of influence for, of reptilian spirits and insectoid spirits, um, which is interfering um, in sometimes a positive, sometimes not so positive way with our um, our current incarnation. Um, what you see often in, especially um, a lot of the reptilian forms, is that they have a very well um, developed uh, sensorum. They can, um, in a way, just like birds in, in our physical reality, they can sense a lot more different types of energy. They have a much, much bigger range of energies they can perceive. We have a very limited vision. We have like tunnel vision almost energetically and they can deal with a lot more complexity. So these are some of the advantages these reptilian forms um, tend to have over us. But also to deal with this complexity, uh, they have developed their minds a lot more than we have. So compared to us, they're a little bit like um, yeah, the logical Dr. Spock or Mr. Spock from, from Star Trek. Um, so they regard all, this, all these energies and the, the universe like a kind of a mechanism. And they understand, want to understand the mechanism and use the mechanism for their purposes, which may be good or evil. But yeah, to our mind, they are very rational, very logical, and uh, not as emotional as us, although they can be acting out of compassion. And we find this strange and threatening because we cannot follow their logic. They, they're usually mentally quite superior to us to our intellect and they can deal with complexities and dimensions we cannot perceive. Um, so we often find their, their presence quite imposing and overwhelming and confusing. And these um, yeah, experiences of confusion um, are often uh, translated into, into fear and from fear into, into aggression and into uh, paranoia and other things. So we have a natural fear of things which are alien to us or strange to us, which causes a lot of conflict between us and the reptilians. But also one of the things is that from the reptilian point of view, just like from the higher point of view, they look at the destiny of the world or of, of a country or of a species. And they're not so interested in the individual. The individual is a tool to be used. And uh, we are actually in a process of developing our individualization. And there we are a little bit ahead of them or more disturbed by it than them, depending on how you look at it. But this, um, we feel that the reptilians are a threat to our individualization process. And this is causing a lot of friction because we are going more deeply into the individualization ourselves. And that yeah, creates friction with this reptilian influence, which is currently yeah, manifesting on our planet. So they are not by, uh, by nature... Uh, um, they don't have to be aromatic. They can also be luciferic or, or nature-oriented. But on our world, they tend to manifest a lot in the aromatic structures. Um, because our nature structures are, uh, are rapidly decaying, so they're looking for uh, powers which, power structures which are more strong, more stable, to carry their impulse. And uh, our luciferical impulse is very much focused on individualization, not so much our development as a group or as a species. And so they find themselves more or less forced into the aromatic corner on our world, but this is not always their nature or their natural cosmos in their own worlds. So it's not always their preferred course of action, but because of the structure of our society, they tend to end up in the Arimana corner. Um, okay. So there is a, uh, a little addenda uh, to the previous question about the Anunnaki, the reptilians who allegedly uh, created humanity. Well, there is a lot of stories about that. Hmm. Uh, 
and um, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just go back back to 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 my experience because um, I've had a few experiences which uh, which pertain to this. Um, one of them is I went to um, a place which is a holy site to the Aboriginals in. Um, uh, Australia and as you may know that the Aboriginals have a very clear uh, memory of the creation of the world and the creation of all the species and they call it the dream time and they have uh, places where they can connect to the dream time to the powers who created this world so I went to one of these uh, these holy places and entered the dream time there and I met um, yeah, one of the, the, the creator spirits um, in the uh, Aboriginal uh, sense. And I, I talked to it and asked it like, um, yeah, what's he been involved with? And um, he basically wasn't here for a long time, according to him. Um, and not a long time, according to him, is dozens of millions of years. So that's kind of the time scale these creator spirits work on and he felt that um, uh, attracted to the planet because of course after the um, yeah um, the death of the dinosaurs there was a lot of possibility a lot of niches opened up and uh, he and other spirits many of him, them have left again um, felt interested in building up a new ecology in this uh, in this planet so they came here with uh, a grand plan to create uh, a, a variety of species and interactions between species so that all the animals and beings could learn from each other, could grow together as a, as a group, could e evolve together as a group in their consciousness and in their complexity. And there are, are of course many parts which were, um, which were created in this time. And there um, their plan was more or less to, uh, to in a way tailor make or tailor grow uh, bodies. So they just looked at the demands of all the other planets which they felt connected to or in tune with and um, they in a way uh, asked spirits to come from different planets to try on the different bodies to say like okay do you like this body yes or no and well if you don't like this body then we discontinue the, the project and the species would die out and then they would yeah either the spirits would just stay on their own planet or yeah if it was interested the spirits would migrate to come to live on our planet maybe because the bodies are more interesting or the life is more interesting here than it is in their own planet so they tried to create a very uh, like resort like planet where yeah, beings from many other planets could live and incarnate and grow together. And this was in a time when the energetic atmosphere of our planet was very open. So it was very easy to have this travels and incarnation between planets. But uh, there was a bit of a side effect to the, the life forms they created because the life forms became more and more complex. And they started to develop things like emotions, uh, 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 group consciousness, uh, individual consciousness, uh, culture eventually um, and uh, all these layers of energy which were in a way transpersonal, they're bigger than the person they hardened and they created a shell around the planet so that the beings which disincarnate here they're in a way trapped in the same cycle they can't easily go to another planet anymore they have to reincarnate on the same planet and also spirits from other planets, they can't incarnate on our planet anymore because they have to become part of a group, a group mind and a culture and a time frame and a thought pattern and all kinds of these filters which have evolved on our planet. Um, so our evolution has had some yeah, side effects which really hampered migration and contact with, uh, with alien civilizations. And now, around this 2012 crux, it is a little bit more easy than it used to be. So it's a little bit going back to the original state when they started the formation of the species. Um, but um, 
the idea which I heard that we are um, meant as slaves or cattle or or other things um, I could find no no reference in this um, yeah in this being's memory and he's been around for a while um, what you do find though is that actually um, there was a big um, disturbance but it's not so much by an Anunnaki kind of species unless you would consider the Atlantean migration uh, to be something of this sort um, because the, the world was very much um, focused on collectivism it was a very collective process of growth and in a way humans and animals there was no real essential difference in, uh, in, in consciousness. Humans were yeah, considered to be a of a higher consciousness but the nature of their consciousness was the same and there was no idea of duality, no idea of good and bad, light and dark and other contrasts like that of male and female. And basically with the, um, when the um, Atlantean spirit started to, to migrate to this world they brought with them the uh, idea of individuality, of light and dark, of uh, this division. Because this is how they work, this is how they generate power by, in a way, taking a hole, splitting, in a way, the atom, the unsplittable, and then a lot of energy is released by splitting it and a lot of energy is released by fusing it. So, in a way, just like we developed the process of nuclear uh, fission and nuclear fusion, they have developed the process of energetic fission and uh, fusion. And this really, um, um, the Atlanteans preferred to live in as high as possible life form, so they started to incarnate in the human bodies. And um, they, of course, wanted to, in a way, uh, control all the other energies by splitting them and fusing them and working with them and harvesting this world. Um, so this is, you could say, a very Arimanic um, impulse um, the, um, the Atlanteans carried with them. And uh, this really started to change things on the world. So in a way, the other animals and the nature spirits and the land spirits, they were no longer our brothers and our sisters and sometimes you would incarnate as a human and then as a dog and then as a cat but the hierarchy became more and more fixed. Uh, it was that stronger powers would govern weaker powers, as is the very Aramanic nature of the Aramanic cosmos. And uh, this Atlantean impulse really started to enslave the weaker ones. So you started to have hierarchies where the priests uh, controlled the, um, the people and then the kings and the nobles started to control the people, and now the rich people start to control the, the rest of the people. But they don't just control other people, but they also want to control nature spirits and either destroy them or use them, and the same with elemental spirits. So if you want to look at who are the tyrants who enslave us, well, it is mainly the current present-day humans. These are really the ones who transform and twist all the life forms on earth. Um, so we tend to, in, in lots of legends, they're represented as an alien being, but these stories are actually originated from an original um, yeah, the spirits of humanity, which no longer inhabit humanity as much anymore. So, um, okay, I see there's some confusion about 2012. Okay. <laughs> um, gosh, okay, um, so as I said our solar system is linked to many other solar systems and um, depending on yeah, uh, constellations, just like our planet is connected to other uh, 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 planets, depending on a certain constellation, the energy of the Moon or of Mars or of Venus is stronger or certain planets act together or they act against each other. So in a way there is an energetic tide and the energy in the world is constantly shifted back and forth by the moon and the other planets. And in the same way it happens between solar systems. So our solar system is also 
they are revolving around the cosmos and connected to other stars in the neighborhood. And uh, just like with the moon, you can have a high tide, a full moon, where the influence of the moon is felt most strongly, and when the moon is closer to the earth, it is also felt more strongly. And so you also have cosmic cycles, where in a way the energy of the other solar systems is at their peak. And we're actually in the middle of, uh, of such a period, which happen around every 6,000 years, a little bit less. And that's, yeah, we are very much in tune or in contact with other solar systems. And we can uh, feel their impulses and it is also more easy to migrate between solar systems. So if you die now, it is much easier to incarnate in another solar system and not to be trapped by the filters of the Earth. Um, than it would be if you if you died in another time, and also they can incarnate here and come and uh, uh, yeah live here, and egregores can travel more freely. So it's a very uh, interesting time. It's a time of sowing and reaping. The beings which are ready to leave the earth, they often go to another solar system, but also the other solar systems are sowing or creating energetic seeds to plant on the earth to see if they can make it better or more at least uh, suitable to their kind so they can incarnate here. Because on many of these other solar systems there is no life and um, that there is life on, uh, on this earth makes it a very valuable commodity. And many spirits would like to have incarnations here but for that they need proper life forms and also now proper yeah, emotional states, proper individual states, proper culture, proper thought patterns. So there's a lot involved in shaping uh, our society now. And um, if you look at the pyramids, which were built during actually the last or the previous of this uh, uh, yeah, uh, conjunctions, many of these pyramids are in a way uh, constructed to maintain the contact between other solar systems and our solar system. So the natural contact will fade out, it's actually starting to fade out very slowly. But um, because these energies are very clear and they can inspire us now, we can build temples or structures or antenna, so, uh, or little colonies. So this energy um, connection we have with the other solar system can remain open and the flow can keep on flowing to our world and inspire our culture. Unfortunately, this is not done very much, and it is mainly done by the dark side of the cosmos and not so much by the light side of the cosmos. Because the dark side is very interested in, in gaining a foothold, and the light side is more passive, more saying like, well, if you want us, we will come. But we are not inviting very much. Um, so it's, it's, the process itself is going not as good as it could go. So, yes, I talked about the reptilians, which are actually uh, us these days, <laughs> the invaders. Uh, okay, so there's a remark. So I guess a lot of the spirits of nature, of the nature cosmos, are now fleeing and leaving the earth. Yes, this unfortunately is true. Um, it's, it's been a very interesting time um, and uh, we, we see some efforts of, of some of the, the, the gods and the, the higher beings who actually uh, um, helped these nature spirits to, to incarnate here. Uh, they're coming back to help to harmonize things, to help, to, uh, to help their children in a way because the, the nature spirits came from their cosmos and from their solar systems, they incarnated here and even though it's many thousands or millions of years ago they still care for them, they still see them as their brothers and sisters so a lot of these powers are now returning to the earth and trying to help their children who are suffering or having problems or not managing to deal with the world and, and all the changes but also because of the opening and the possibility to go back to yeah, their original planets and solar systems where they came from millions of years ago, many spirits are now also taking this opportunity of leaving the Earth. So it's very interesting. So in a way the spiritual 
cosmos of the nature beings is getting a lot more support, a lot more influx of, of revitalizing energies, but it is also at the same time, even though there are more positive energies and guidance coming in, it is still shrinking. So the positive energies which are being fed to it are not um, relatively not enough uh, compared to the energies which are flowing mainly in, in from the Arimanic cosmos, from the Arimanic influences. And as I said, it is unfortunately also, uh, I find unfortunate, <laughs> that's why I say it, because I'm from the nature cosmos, um, that mainly these Arimanic influences are the most invited influences from these other uh, solar systems, from these other planets now. Um, okay. Yes, and um, if we look at the, the, the um, in a way the, the, we talked about how yeah, current humanity and the split between light and dark was actually brought here by the Atlantean spirits who basically weren't doing a very good job at their own planet. And this is in a way their, their second chance. So the, the story of Atlantis uh, being destroyed is actually they kind of like wrecked their own planet by messing too much with powers and their experiments went out of control so now we they are continuing their experiments on this planet and you would think they would have learned a little bit more in the past thousands of years but I don't think they're doing very well either at the moment but a lot of them are more are a lot more aware because it's racial consciousness that they destroyed one planet already and if they don't want to continue destroying planets, and especially planets with life, because they're quite rare, um, I hope they will actually learn how to deal with these powers, and mainly, and that's the important lesson for the Atlanteans, how to respect the power they're manipulating. Because this is the essence of their, of their lesson on Earth. Um, it is okay to be a greater power, it is okay to be Arimanic, it's okay to be a guiding force and to control things and to split things and to fuse things, but you have to also see the limits of your power, like what can I do and what can, can't I do, so you don't push yourself too far. And the other thing which they need to learn is also to respect the nature and the path of the power they're manipulating. So if I'm manipulating a stone or an elemental power or a nature spirit, that is fine as long as I do not disturb its evolution, its own path. Because ultimately, otherwise, the, yeah, your slave is going to run away and say like, okay, I'm not going to harmonize your world anymore, you take care of it yourself. And when these harmonizing forces are gone, then we have all the power we want, because there's nothing disagreeing with us anymore, but we also have all the responsibility. And we have to learn to... Yeah, to say like, okay, if I take the power, I have also to take the responsibility. And that's the big lesson for the Atlanteans. So let's hope they learn it, and either in, in this cycle or the next. Um, I had some hopes that they would actually learn it at the end of this cycle, when also their memories start coming back from destroying their own world and other things. These racial memories are also inspired by their own home solar systems. But yeah, besides making some movies about 2012, which none of them were very good, I don't think that most of the incarnated spirits are doing very well in reawakening and learning. So, quite slow learners. Hmm. Okay, uh, we're getting a little bit sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> And we've already been busy for about an hour and a half. Um, and I really like the questions for today. Um, yeah. I, I think I will just have to save the questions until, uh, until next week. Because it was a very big topic just in the first question to, uh, to answer or to go into. Um, I'll just see if there's any more uh, more questions on this. Oh, can I post them? I will. Um. And 
That's another question in Dutch, which is also very good. So I will just translate the, the, the question in Dutch. It is um, to talk about the, the journey of the spirit and exactly what happens when we leave the body and when the body dies and how much of it is truth or illusion, what is coming from actually the physical body and what's actually a spiritual experience when you come to things like the, the tunnel of light and seeing your life unfold around you and other things and that's also a very nice question um, but yeah we will uh, go into these things uh, uh, next week um, so are there more questions about today's topic about the guardians and the, uh, and the egregores and the guides Oh yeah, I will say one more thing. Um, that's also about the, um, the insectoids, because I haven't talked about them yet. Um, the, the insectoids are very different in general from the, from the reptilians. Uh, what you see with insectoids is that they are uh, in a way the opposite of reptilians. So the reptilians tend to go for the big picture, they want to see all energies and the whole cosmos and um, they de-individualize completely sometimes because it all becomes very mental. Um, um, and what you see with the insectoids is they go in the opposite direction. Uh, they're very much about uh, focus and the narrowing of focus. So often if you see an insectoid form, uh, they're often extremely idealistic. So they have uh, the idea of one solution fits all. So the idea of like, okay, we should have uh, capitalism or communism or democracy or uh, humanism or uh, we should all become Islamic or Christian or whatever. These are often more uh, impulses which are more insectoid in nature. So they want to have uh, a great uniformity um, of everything should be the same or everything should be perfected in, in, in one way. Everything should be a perfect Muslim or a perfect Christian or a perfect Buddhist. And um, this narrowing where everything else is considered as unnecessary, superfluous, uh, distracting or worthless. This is more the, the insectoid influence. Um, so they go more for a, for a monoculture. And um, because of this focus, they focus all their attention, all their life force on a single point. They're unbeatable in this point. So they're, they're exceedingly skilled. So for instance, if they're about healing, well, you won't find another race who knows as much about the physical body or healing as they do. Or if they're about uh, destruction or war, well, all their attention, all their power is focused on that singular point. So they won't understand anything else. There is only a very small, limited window of reality for them. And actually, the insectoids, they're much more popular with current humanity than the reptilians are. And I think that a lot of fear for the reptilians, which is inspired on the internet and conspiracy theories and whatever, is actually engendered by the insectoids who, in a way, feel that humanity likes them a lot more than they like the, the reptilians. And they feel that there's a very good chance of them taking over the planet instead of the reptilians taking over the planet. Um, because humans like simplicity. We like simple answers. We want a higher power to control everything. We want to, uh, to say like, okay, God agrees with us and everything is right. And um, yeah, we want to have a simple rule and we don't need to care about anything else. So our intellectual laziness in a way pushes us towards the uh, insectoid life forms. 
which although many of them are more evolved than we are, um, they're more narrow than the, than the reptilian life forms. But these reptilian, in a way, influences and insectoid influences, they tend also to fight over control of the planet. And since most of our controllers are of insectoid nature, um, uh, we tend to see the reptilians more as invaders because we don't recognize that we've already been invaded for quite a while, about several centuries, by insectoids. So it is just that the new invaders look more alien to us than the old invaders. But yeah, they're still invaders. <laughs> and the um, insectoids have also a much stronger foothold on this planet than uh, the reptilian invaders. The insectoids have been working with the destinies of humanity for already tens of thousands of years. They've been around and they've guided humanity for a very long time and they continue to guide us. Um, so that's basically um, the issue. But if you look at the reptilian, uh, of, uh, at the insectoid rule, it has led to nationalism, it has led to religious wars, and if we continue in following this insectoid rule, we will continue having fights between uh, religion and science and um, in, in a continued fragmentation and polarization of our society. And as I said before, since we are in a little bit Arimanic, Luciferic influence, this is likely to continue. But for me personally, as a nature spirit, I don't like this further fragmentation, so I tend to side more with reptilians than insectoids. But that's my personal flavor. <laughs> okay, so are there any more questions? Okay, well, then I think it's time for me to eat something and to wish you all a very good night. And yeah, uh, we can all ponder the questions which we will answer next week. Okay, thank you for listening and thank you for your support. Okay, bye bye. Okay. Well, very interesting.